Hey, everybody, and welcome to the TradFi to DeFi podcast. My name is Tyler, and I'm joined by my co-host, John. And today I'm very excited to introduce one of my friends. This is Daniel from Unbanked. And <laughs> Daniel, I think it would be helpful for our audience if you just wouldn't mind briefly introducing yourself. Who's Daniel? What do you do in the space? And how'd you get into crypto? Yeah, so Daniel Goldman, been in the space for a long time, you know, since 2017. Not, that's not that long, but long enough, I guess. And uh, if uh, founder of Unbanked, which is now w winding down and non-operational due to several things we can talk about. Uh, as to how I got in it, like so many others, I, I had uh, knew some really great people, uh, the Pablo Escobar Foundation and some other folks out of Mexico and Colombia uh, had a really thriving business and they had, <laughs> no, uh, that's I'm so. I'm this so is bad. going differently than I expected, Daniel. I... <laughs> Between them and some other Russian oligarchs that I knew, we just really hit it off. We thought it was a really great use cases for crypto. No, um, no, I uh, actually, I, uh, I used, to, I was been a multi-time entrepreneur, and um, when we first started Unbanked, it was actually called Turnio, and a developer technology a person in technology called me and said, "I got an idea." And I need you to say yes. And where it was about was about this idea around using a private permissioned blockchain technology on Hyperledger Fabric, not even around, you know, the crypto casino stuff that we all know exists. And it wasn't about investments. It was really about building a real product use case, solving a problem in supply chain of digital advertising. And, uh, and I said yes. And uh, it's funny, though, because when we wrote our 40-page white paper, uh, or he did, I should say, um, it was Hyperledger Fabric with Stellar built on top of it. It was 2017. It was Stellar was very new at that time. Um, and Hyperledger Fabric was just kicking it off. And Ethereum, you know, 2017 was killing it, right? Very interesting, fun times. But there was a lot of excitement going on. And, and it was really about how do you build stuff that's going to solve problems? And we thought that you could create transparency in um, a, an industry that's a growing industry, you know, growing to be a trillion dollar industry, digital advertising, but advertisers don't know where their money's going. And in that white paper, we had one page where we thought, okay, well, the, the advertiser, let's say Coca-Cola, I'm in Atlanta, so Coca-Cola is here, you know, local, and uh, they spend a lot of money in advertising. But there's a lot of fraud in that industry. They don't know where their money's going. Even, uh, even uh, auditors like um, PwC did audits on where is the money going. They couldn't find 15% of the money, let alone the fraud or, you know, the, the, the other things they could, couldn't identify where the money was going. It's, it's, it's a black box. And, um, and so we thought, well, you know, this is easy, you know, slam dunk, because if, if you can then have the advertiser pay the publisher directly, cutting out unnecessary middlemen, you know, you'll have middlemen, but they will be necessary middlemen, not unnecessary middlemen. And you'll have total transparency, et cetera. And then we thought, okay, we're well, going to have that money. Why not connect that to a card? where the publishers can spend, now if you're CNN and you're owned by Warner Brothers, you don't need a card. But if you're a small publisher and you're earning $500 a day or $1,000 a day, well, wouldn't it be cool to get that digital money and then spend that on a card? So it's one page in our white paper and that ended up being the business. And that's what it, you know went from that to unbanked, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the shiny penny of crypto, which was maybe just a small part of your original thesis ended up being the main apparatus through which you wanted to achieve your vision. Well, yeah, because for me, you know, I'm really passionate about this subject now, and I know you are too. Um, it's about money of any kind. It could be U.S. dollars or GBP or Bitcoin or anything else that is that is tra uh, transferred on the blockchain. That is it. And um, to me, having that value of the ability to send money on the blockchain means you don't have to use a bank. It means now you can automate transactions. You have programmable money. Hyperledger Fabric was, I think of it in, in my mind, uh, like a simpleton um, that if you've ever been on a, like, um, a roller coaster ride and you think, okay, well, you know, like one of these really fast roller coasters that just goes, you know, straight shot. Like I think of the money uh, layer, the value layer sitting on top of the data layer and they're just going, going in tandem in this fast shot together. And um, but they can be separate. You can do data transfer with no money or you could do data and value transfer together and they can be they can be, you know, integrated and separate. So that was our use case. But we found out really quickly, you know, trying to convince uh, even though we would have saved a lot of money, we had a lot of interest. But there's a lot of companies 
that are in the middle right now that make a lot of money on a lack of transparency at agencies. Um, they have a thing, what's called a DSP. Uh, we literally had some uh, large, even agencies don't want to have uh, transparency, a lot of them, frankly, because they make a lot of money off a lack of transparency. So you're really fighting this sort of existing system. And we really didn't have like a big client to say, let's do it. And so we really had to go after, we were very little funding. So we had to go after where we were going to make the money and we didn't have money for both. And that's where we rolled out what was we call block card. And uh, the block card was where people could just take their Bitcoin and spend it on a on a on a card on a visa card we were the fourth uh, company in the united states to roll out a card that could spend crypto basically i mean that's pretty far ahead of a lot of the well-known names that are bankrupt today that a lot of people are used to interacting with yeah well that's the problem that's why unbank's no longer around um you know we're not operational at this point and um the reason is when you're, you're the industry experienced a hell of a black swan event between the macro environment from the Fed, I'm very interested in economics and I love talking about all kinds of things, but um, the macro environment created a lot of challenges because we lived in a casino environment, but unbanked didn't really operate in the casino world. The problem was that even if you're running a clean shop and you're, in, and you're doing what you're doing, you're still, you know, um, it's like the United States couldn't just live independently of what was happening in Europe when the Nazis invaded France. We couldn't just live in our own little bubble and think, well, oh, we're just, we're just going to continue to live in our own world. It doesn't work that way. Things are interconnected. It's like the butterfly you know, principle, right? So just because we're doing our thing and we're not even involved in the casino uh, ourselves, we're affected by all the other stuff. So when Celsius goes bankrupt and all their customers' money is kept with them and can no longer transfer over to somewhere else in the ecosystem, right? Or BlockFi and Voyager and FTX and – Genesis and which can can engaged in what appears to me to be massive fraud. That's an opinion only. Um, you know that has a massive impact on and now Prime Trust. Have you seen what you know Prime Trust is doing? So there is uh, just that kind of thing. And we were uh, we engaged. I think we did it right. Um, we kept all customer funds safe. I'm very proud of that. We can hold our heads high when we uh, when we shut down. And it just we just didn't raise a lot of money in five years. We only raised four million dollars, and we talked about this prior. That's like a, a small seed round for most people. So we didn't raise a lot of money, and we didn't have enough money to get through eighteen months or twenty four months of just bad things. Because so, that's what it takes to get through the, the this environment. Yeah. So let's talk about this environment, right? So what exactly are we dealing with right now, and how has the space changed since twenty seventeen? Well, 2017 was a unique year uh, where we had the ICO boom and craze. And, you know, I, I believe that a lot of the boom bust stuff that happened was, um, this is my opinion only. Um, so this is not like me defaming an organization. This is just my opinion, my, what I suspect, not based on anything. But, you know, when you have these stable coins like a tether that basically can print money for free, this is where bad things can happen. So how do you go to $20,000? Well, if you have a stable coin that is printing money and becomes the default currency in the ecosystem, and then they're buying all this Bitcoin because it's free money because they can take their free dollars that they printed, and then now they've got this, you know, all this Bitcoin. And then in 2018, uh, well, now all of a sudden people are calling out on those dollars, and there's not enough dollars because you're running a fractional system. Then you got to sell your Bitcoin reserves in order to, you know, reach the dollars. That's that can create a downward effect on. Bitcoin prices. And I have I to think... just interrupt you there for a second because it's so funny that we create a fractional reserve system on top of a uh, non-fractional based yeah, ecosystem. We do, but that's backed by guns, uh, and we and and we got them. Correct, uh, but t where's Tether's guns, right? So I mean, it's just a different. No it's a totally different situation. <laughs> and well, and that's the other thing too is if 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 Tether was the Fed, then Tether could do that. And if Tether had guns, they could do that. And if Tether was the government, they could do that. But they don't have any of that so when the time they worked more like what a bank would do under the system but they're like a shadow bank and so when the the time got came for them to come up with the money well they had to come they had to have the money is my my take on that and i believe that sell down that massive sell down where we went from nineteen thousand all the way back to 3500 
had some involvement of that kind of shenanigans, those kinds of things, not because it was based on any sort of bad, you know, intentions, but maybe some bad idea. And now, 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 now that those types of things happened in 2017, in my opinion. Um, and that sounds like ancient history to a lot of our audience, because I know some came in in the height of year 2020 and 2021. Right. So this is like early formative time. I remember, you know, losing what little I had on Coinbase around 2017 and 18. During this is this Abraham time. Lincoln times. This is what this is. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, it's true. This is old school. Um, but what's old is new again, and we got to be very careful. I think that where we have to – look, now – Regulars are paying very close attention to stable coins, and they should. They absolutely should. Uh, I think what when Facebook was trying to do their currency, cryptocurrency, it scared the hell out of me. It was very dangerous what they were trying to do. I was very much against it um, because of the way that they were doing it was gnarly. It was very dishonest, uh, in my opinion. They had a basket full of fees, and they were going to charge FX on every single transaction because it wasn't clean dollars to dollars. It was dollars to some – you know, smorgasbord of, of, of mixed currencies. So you don't really know what you're getting. So they could mark the price up at any price they wanted. And they're making FX all day long. And that's how they're going to make money, in my opinion. So I'm glad that got shot down. And I think if you have a stable coin, and we've, as we've seen, look, FTX, you know, Coinbase, Gemini, whomever, whoever it is, some of them are great. And obviously FTX wasn't. Um, the lesson learned for me is all these people talk about decentralization, and blah, 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 blah. But most people don't change their behaviors. It, so we talk about this decentralization, but what we're people doing is they're still keeping all their funds on a centralized exchange, which is crazy to me if you believe in the concept. Now, some people aren't down for the cause. Some people are just like they see on CNBC and they're kind of, you know, look, people are diversifying their um, investment strategies and they're like, oh, well, Bitcoin sounds good. So they see all they see on CNBC is that Bitcoin 30,000, Bitcoin up like a caveman, like we're cavemen, right? Bitcoin go up, Bitcoin go down. And that's all they see. And that's all they know. They have no idea about the fact that Bitcoin has a halving. They have no idea about the fact that Bitcoin has only 21 million, uh, you know, total uh, supply. They don't know any of this stuff. All they know is that they think of it as this thing that may go up in the future, and and so that well because of that lack of real knowledge and, and true understanding of like what crypto can be, they don't understand the importance of having your own wallet. They don't understand the importance of a Web three and what that's going to be, and they don't understand the importance of like what a Uniswap is and smart contract functionality and. All of that to me is what it's all about. It's not about buying Bitcoin and keeping it on exchange. It's about keeping your funds in a digital money that only you yourself can control in your own wallet. And that is the, the real, real innovation of crypto. So, so would you say it's safe to say we've lost our way? We, we have never found our way. It's proven by the fact that there are hundreds of millions of people in the world that carry – cryptocurrency or their own cryptocurrency, I should say, 45 million with Coinbase alone, right? And there's only what, I mean, last time I saw there's only 30 million downloads of MetaMask. Okay, that's the number one, now there's others, right? But that's the number one wallet that people use, MetaMask. So the amount of people that actually use their own wallets versus centralization, there, there is a very, very big fall off. And I think that comes from just a lack of education. So it's not like we were there and then we fell off. We just never, I don't think most people got there. Most people, it's too, it's a little confusing for people. We got to build better tech. We got to make it <clears throat> easier for people to use the, 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 you know, trying to track your, um, your, your code, your key phrases is, is hard for some people. It's confusing. And then you have things like – so a lot of people, word of mouth, they hear about things like Ledger. And, of course, Ledger got massive um, kickback, uh, pushback, and they should. And I would never use a Ledger now, never, because if there's a, a an internal key or code, something that basically uh, gives access to my, my, my wallet, why do I – my hardware, why would I even have the hardware if there's a backdoor? And that's what they've said there is unless they've corrected that. That's – ridiculous to me. So to me, it's about having complete control of your own destiny, understanding though, that you are still risk of massive problems from a chain getting hacked 
to you being stupid and uh, not not intentionally, but uh, connecting your wallet to something and your wallet getting completely cleaned out. So so for all the stuff I'm talking about with the benefits of not having centralization, there are negatives that can be you can consider equal because at least with Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini, you can trust them. You know, trust them in theory, right? That's the problem. That's the that's the problem. You can trust them to do it right if they're really. But I I would have told you that about FTX. I wouldn't have thought that would have happened. Yeah, Daniel, that's kind of uh, a point that that Tyler and I have talked about quite a bit lately, or at least in the past uh, last six months or a year, is that that's what's holding back real adoption is this, you know, very. Uh, I don't know. People, it's not. It's still opaque to a lot of people. It's supposed to be transparent, but but people still don't understand key phrases. And my my thoughts are, they shouldn't have to. That if that if if you're going to take, especially people in my generation, although we're fading away and we'll be gone by the time crypto is uh, in forty it, years. It, I think you got yeah, a while. Yeah. You know, but 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 to say, but to say that is is that. To get people, the average man on the street who lives by their debit card or their credit yeah. card, yeah. they haven't written a check. They haven't even been to their local branch in five years to deposit cash. Yeah, uh, that's the world we live in, and it's just it it it, it has to be so stupid a caveman can do it. Just to borrow it a phrase, it and, does. and 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 you're right. We didn't miss it, or we didn't. You know, it, we we dropped off. We just never got there, I think, and and yeah. uh, I I don't see enough projects going in that direction to solve those. I know they're out there, and there's some good ones. They were with unbanked, Tr- right? Right. I mean, you Trying were bridging these worlds. Problem. Trying, you know, to. yeah, you know, and and then there's then there's a second problem in the background, and that is just the culture of crypto itself. This, you know, and everybody should have custody of their own funds nobody yes. nobody should ever give away their their money for somebody to hold in a, a a bank somewhere in order to use it in our system but in the meantime there's there's people in crypto that if you even you know they just want the dollar to die and go away and it's like that's that may happen one day but that's not where we are right now that's that's just like that's just like people who go, we need to do away with all petroleum and all nuclear power and just live off the sun and wind. You know, it's a great ideal. It's a great goal to go, but we're not there yet. And there's these steps to get there that some people just, they're just like, oh, the Fed's terrible. I'm not a fan of the Fed. I'm not a fan of the dollar, but it's there and it's entrenched very heavily. And then we're not just going to push them out of the way and go, you know, we're in a crypto world now. And I actually people, think, okay. I, I, I just think people are so opposed that they're not able to accept those in-between steps to get us there. And I, and I guess maybe, and that's, and that's my thought on it. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's what's holding people back. We need, we need better design and people, I believe in personal accountability, people have to learn it doesn't help when you're on CNBC and all you see is Bitcoin go up, Bitcoin go down. That's it. There's no education there. So we all have to kind of take personal responsibility. Look, if you if you if you look in the mirror and you feel like you've gained some weight, well, suck it up, buttercup. You're gonna have to change your diet and work out a little bit. And if you don't, that's on you. And from a financial perspective, if you choose that you want to exist in this world of the old system, that you that's your choice. But I think the younger generation, it's inevitable that is the, no disrespect, John, but as the boomers die off, that the younger generation and they will continue. And uh, and I think that will just be where it goes. But I will say that I think crypto is the best thing that ever happened to the dollar. Um, people around the world, it's the number one current. Uh, first of all, we talk about the reserve currency being the dollar, uh, which it is. But but I've done so much traveling around the world and you know, unbanked was very focused on. It was very American centric, but very focused on like international too. And people all around the world want access to dollars. They really do. And the problem is, in an old, we'll call it two D world, right? For lack of a better term, two D versus three D. 
In old 2D world, you got to go to a bank. And that's all. How do you get distribution of dollars if you're trying to keep your funds? And Nigeria has this dynamic ecosystem. Um, the largest uh, population in all of Africa is scheduled or uh, projected to have a billion people by the end of this century, right? Crazy. China will get older and, and, and actually start to reduce in population is expected. India is going to continue to have tons of babies uh, and Nigeria is going to be up there. And, and these people are very dynamic and energetic and entrepreneurial, but they can't get dollars and their government sucks so much. We talk about, we think the US government's got problems. Maybe we look like, it's like, we're like the skinniest, skinniest kid at fat camp um, because Nigeria won't even let you have, it used to be a maximum of 20 US dollars a month and now they won't let you have any. And so people in Nigeria are desperate to have US dollars. So now in a 3D world where you have access to crypto, people can have dollars. now. You know, we could say, well, I got issues with that. I prefer not everyone's built for, you know, I wasn't ready for that drop in Bitcoin that went from 30 to 20, 25 or 26 for, for normal people, normal, right? We're all normal in some capacity. You're budgeting, you're planning. Nobody feels good. Now, it feels great when you get free money, but that is not sustainable. It does not always go up only. There are going to be massive drops and there are going to be manipulations in markets. That happens in every single kind of market. Whether it's Goldman Sachs manipulating aluminum prices, which they have, or silver, uh, right? These types of things happen. And so crypto was heavily speculative and manipulated. manipulated. Um, but Daniel, it's okay when TradFi does it. Oh, it's, it's just not okay fine. when crypto does it. Yeah. They'll just pay a fine. They'll just pay a fine. Um, so no, but, but so I do think dollars have a really important role, and I think the U.S. can lead in that way. But here's the cool thing in my, my opinion. So let's just say in a world where people have access to dollars. I believe in capitalism, and capitalism does not work without competition. And Alan and Greenspan talk about old school. Do you remember Tyler? You know Alan Greenspan? Yeah, he actually wrote a really good memo on gold, actually. But okay. then he kind of changed his whole attitude towards gold and interest rates when he took over. Well, he so was the that's about as was, much as I know. He was the Warren Buffett of money printing uh, until things went sideways, right, John? I'm sure you know. He was considered the the you know infallible wise man. If if Alan Greenspan said it, it was true. It was like Warren Buffett spoke and God spoke out of you know. Um, and I remember one time, and you just get these little things you remember over time. And one thing I remember he said about the the monetary system. We just said that the monetary the U.S. dollar we can keep printing as long as we want, as long as there's no competition to the dollar. I remember him saying that very clearly. And so if you believe in capitalism and you believe that in order to have a, a – we learn from the wealth of, um, wealth of nations, right, um, that, that capitalism always tends to lead towards uh, monopolies. And, and also – and I wrote about this on LinkedIn just a minute – a, a little bit ago – that we talk about – so what is socialism? Socialism is when government – it, 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 I hate when people misuse, misrepresent socialism. Like Obama was a socialist. Okay, you can hate Obama for all kinds of things. He was not a socialist. Okay, period. He was not a socialist. You can say there was policies you didn't like. Blah blah blah. Socialism is when the government takes control of the means of production. That is a clear definition. So if we can all agree, and by the way, it's never worked in the history of man. Ever. Socialism doesn't work, and it might work in some day where we have robots and AI doing everything because then you can have you can have actually um, – you, you got to have production, but that's a whole other conversation. The point is socialism doesn't work. Okay, but we never seem to think about the fact that when it comes to the means of production, the U.S. government and every government around the world maintains the means of production of money, period, which is weird. Because that's capitalism because it's production money, but the government does it. So a long way to say that if you believe in capitalism, you believe in competition of markets for it to work. And for competition of markets, I'd say if you don't like U.S. dollars like John doesn't, cool. You want to be in the Swiss franc? Great. We want to give people access to be able to sw switch their money quickly and let the markets work it out if it's the Chinese you know, RMB, which nobody trusts. Or the digital the the dollar. 
It's going to keep people honest. Competition forces keeping people honest. And so now you don't, you're don't, you not forced to work through this distribution system of the banks, which is what needed to happen back in the day, but we don't need that anymore. So now you have people – we'll still have banks, but for different reasons, and they have an important role in our ecosystem, but not necessarily where I need you to custody my money. So now if I want to be in gold, digital gold, Bitcoin or Ethereum or dollars or whatever, point is – I now have that ability to keep my money in value, in some form of value, if I keep all my money in Apple stock. But the difference is the old 2D system is i got to go through a broker. I'm forced to go through a bank. And the reason banks exist is because <clears throat> they're necessary in a 2D world because why? Because if I have all my wealth, I'm either going to have to put the money. I'm going to have to dig, it, dig a bunch of holes like Pablo Escobar, right? Literally did that. Have to have uh, all my money in gold. Where, who's going to hold my gold? Do I? At some point, someone's going to have to hold your wealth because you can't keep all your cash in your mattress or a, be a pirate and dig, dig a hole. You know. So literally now with digital money though, I could have a billion dollars. And like my father-in-law who left Iran with nothing. He had a great job, but he lived through the mullahs and all the stuff of the revolution. My wife was born in America, moved back lived through the revolution, and they wanted to go back to America, the, the land of the free. They had to leave everything. This guy with three master's degrees had to immigrate back to the United States with nothing to work as a janitor in a hotel, even though he had three master's degrees in engineering. But in a world in 2023, you don't have to do that. People who leave Ukraine who are having to go through that or Syria, and they're immigrating. Imagine how much better their life can be, and also the world – that for people who are actually having to absorb that immigration, that situation, they're coming with their money. So now their money's digital and there's a market to it. And you don't have to leave, worry about the money that's left in the bank, left physically somewhere. Now you have digital money that you can go and use everywhere. So I'm a really, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. But there's so many reasons why people need to have the ability to control their own wealth and to keep it with them wherever they want. They, don't, they won't re be required to have a custodian. But – if you wish to, more power to you if that's what it makes sense for you personally. That's such a compelling and convincing vision as to why we need digital money. And it's important what kind of digital money that you're referring to, of course. We're talking about immutable blockchain-based networks yep. where your money cannot be taken from you and it is that's censorship right. resistant. That's right. Um, there not are not a, a lot private of permission system. None of that. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny when you were talking about the reserve uh, currency of Tether and how our existing bank system is a reserve currency, but it's backed by the military. Do you agree maybe that the reason the regulators have been really tough on crypto lately is that they're going after competition to the U.S. money system, or at least the regulators think that? Because my take is that regulators haven't yet figured out that stable coins like USDC or PayPal's new stable coin are going to be some of the greatest exporters of the U.S. dollar that That's has right. ever come to technology. That's right. The fact that international countries want exposure to the dollar in the form of a stablecoin, how would you not want to support a variety of these private tokenized versions of dollars to exist? Why wouldn't you want that? It, it should be the greatest tool against China that America could possibly it have be. in its foreign policy belt. Why it are they be. wrong about this? Well, you mentioned China, and I'll answer your question, but you know, people think, oh, China was so you know, innovative. No, China was being uh, reactive. Why? Because the Chinese people, literally Chinese, I don't mean American Chinese, I mean like Chinese Chinese, who uh, buy Bitcoin, what do they use to buy Bitcoin? Do you know? They use fucking Tether. They use dollars. Oh. So think about it. You got there's like a billion two <laughs> Chinese. You got 1.4 billion Indians. And literally all these people, there's probably a, probably a hundred million Indians that, that, that buy, that have crypto in some form or fashion. And, uh, and all of these people are buying it with dollars. Now it's, it's a derivative, you know, Tether is doing, I think clean job. Now they're, they're having to show their books, some and all that, but, but, that's why the Chinese government responded that is because they saw they had to react. And so to your point, now what I'm worried about with – okay, so the Fed's looking at – you know, they talked about um, – you probably heard um, the Fed now 
And, you know, like you got uh, Kennedy saying it's a CBDC, it's bad news, blah, blah, blah. It's Fed now is not a CBDC. Fed now, I can't, Daniel Goldman cannot go and buy the Fed now dollar on the marketplace because why? Because you can only engage with the Fed now system if you're a bank, period. So all it is is SEPA, is all it is. It's a better, cheaper, uh, uh, in, um, system for the banks, not for when the real CBDC comes, we'll all be, it'll look a lot different. Well, it would have to, because the CBDC by definition means you can put it in a wallet, which means an individual can hold it. That's what mm -hmm. a CBDC is. Now where it scares the, the, the hell out of me is that, and this is the fight of our generation, in my opinion, um, it, I care about privacy. I believe in privacy, although it's not a constitutional right. Um, that's why the Roe versus Wade thing uh, went sideways because because privacy is not the right of an individual under the Constitution. By the way, uh, but I do believe in privacy uh, for for all people, um, and so specifically financial rights. And a private permissioned uh, blockchain, like what the Facebook was trying to do, um, you see it some now, and um, even with Circle. I believe, but where they can shut off your money, which is a they you know even using Ethereum, they did it already. That really worries me. Where you're on a chain that or you're using a product that can be shut off, because at that point, we've really got to fight for that. We've got to fight because it, it's the old Jewish uh, thing from the Holocaust, where they say first they came for the you know the whatever, and I didn't say anything, you know that whole thing, right? Um, and, and it's true. If we're not really vigilant about the privacy element of money because the normal people don't really understand and don't care or whatever, then we're going to lose that battle. They're going to absolutely do the G7, Europe, their, Canada, the United States, all these countries that care about freedom, uh, supposedly, you know, that, that's our brand. But when it comes to financials, we're no different than the Chinese. We want to know every single aspect of, our, of your life financially. Period. That's a true statement. And I've been saying that. And I'm on record for that, for saying that for, for forever. It doesn't matter if you're Republican. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat. It doesn't matter what your politics are because at the end of the day, no matter who you think you like, and minus like a Ron Paul kind of individual, right? Like, you know, th those kind of people that are very, very unique, right? Uh, the government is dead set on wanting to know all your elements. And so uh, Janet Yellen is an old person. Joe Biden is an old person. Donald Trump is an old person. Nancy Pelosi, no longer running the, the House, but former speaker, very old. Mitch McConnell can barely walk. I mean, they, now, and he's having issues. These are all very old people. And, and you might have reasons you dislike them or like them for all kinds of things. But I'll tell you what, none of them understand is this fucking money. <laughs> None of them. And uh, and Jan and I will say also, to be fair, the real pain that happened in the crypto ecosystem came after the bad actors. It came really after FTX. Like FTX was the – because why? Because you got this asshole, Sam Bankman fried says, I'm not like the other people. I'm one of the good people. And then it's all bullshit. And then – so now – you know, now it's like, well, you're all say you're good. You're all say you're doing good things, but look at this it's, company it's, and that company and the other company and this other company. It's perfectly convenient it for is. the government and the regulators that we have these bad actors. And you look at how closely affiliated FTX was with a variety of political organizations yeah. and individuals. And you can't help but think of the Hegelian dialectic. Are you familiar with this problem, no. reaction, solution? You have like if the government breaks your leg and then sells you a wheelchair sort of a situation. It's great business. so perfect. Yeah, great <laughs> business to be in, right? And so I share your skepticism about politics. That's one of the things John and I had as one of our most standard, biggest goals here is like politics is, is irrelevant. It At is the end irrelevant. of the day, yeah. there are the men with treasure and the men with guns. Yeah. And those are the ones who are setting the world order. And so, of course, you have this Bitcoin thesis, which strikes at the base of that whole idea that the government is the only controller and arbiter of currency, of money, of value, that completely spooks them. And so it wouldn't surprise me if you would have uh, agents, and it's, it's actually a well-known fact among many of my friends in the industry, there are absolutely government operatives in a variety of different digital asset companies who are doing work for the US government behind the scenes, CIA operatives. I mean, look at this uh, 
um, Tether guy, this developer who's being chased after by the authorities because he built code. He's being attacked. I, I got to show you the link. I, of I the, share uh, that to me. I'd love to read one it. One of the developers from the Tornado Cache is being chased. I'll find the link for it. We'll oh, talk. that I'd heard about the Tornado Cache guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you're interesting. You you mentioned something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. Like I said, history, all these things. The, you, the first central bank that ever existed in the history of man came through. I don't want to say it was the 1600s, late late 1600s. Do you know which country it was? It was the Netherlands. It was the Dutch. Okay, so I don't know if they were the Netherlands at the time. There was the Dutch, and it was going well, or maybe it was Sweden. But either way, it was up there. And then the Brits saw what had happened. I'm pretty sure it was the Dutch. And the Brits saw the second one, and they did it a few years after. And the reason why the, the Brits did it was because they had a king, of course. The king was trying to fight a war with the French. And the problem was the old school way of doing things was that you would um, – the the king would borrow money from the wealthy land the uh, you know landowners borrow money and never seemingly would pay them back promise they would give an iou and they would never pay them back and so the the wealthy landlords people who owned a lot of land they didn't want to give money to the king to fund his wars because he was never going to pay him back and uh and then, you know the idea would be if you win the war you could you know loot and pillage or whatever right like the vikings did um so so the Brits modeled their central bank after the Dutch or Swedes, and they beat the French with the it poised by the fact that they were actually able to print money, and that led to things like you hear about the Dutch East Indies Company, uh, or you know the the their, what was the monopoly John that they had on the the British had the Indian Trading Company, East India East Trading Company, East, Trading East Company. India Trading Company. That there, all of that came out of that central bank um, that that was created, and it was created to solve a problem, and that ended up becoming a massive weapon. But it was fractional and all these other things, and so there was a lot of gamification of money. But prior to that, the reason I say all that is because prior to that, central banks didn't exist, and the money was basically gold. And even for that time. When uh, even Newton was, did you know Newton was a treasurer for the for the um, Brit for Britain? Like, yeah, did he lose all of his money in speculative investments? That I didn't know. But Sir Isaac Newton, this person we always hear about as a scientist, was the treasurer, was the guy that literally the mint, the head of mint, and there was a reason for it because they had all this like people would creatively, if you have a gold coin, it's worth a dollar, and then or whatever you know, and then. They would nick off a little bit of gold. It's still worth a dollar, and they'd take all these little nicks that they'd take, and then they'd go sell it to the to the Dutch for uh, an arbitrage, take that gold, and then buy more of the gold. It was just this massive arbitrage play. But um, but anyway, they they had massive problems, and so we 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 used gold for so long. And I don't like gold as a system because, by the way, only there's been five Great Depressions in the history of the United States, and all of them were under the gold standard. Okay, all of them. So. I don't believe in the gold standard as a principle. I don't like the idea of a Bitcoin standard. I think it's a horrible idea that will lead to a depression. It could cause real pain. But I do like the idea and believe in the idea of privacy and markets and allow market competition to do its thing. And if John is a big fan and wants to spend only Dogecoin, that's all he, he believes in Doge, man. Good for you, brother. You know, like we're, I'm with you. And, but if, if somebody else, grandma is like, I don't really know about this, but I want to deal in dollars. Well, that's cool too. As far as I'm concerned, let the individual – and that means globally people who are like in Zimbabwe. Did they know there was a time when Zimbabwe, people had their money in dollars, and one day the government just said, sorry, no more dollars, but we're going to give you all the Zimbabwe money. And so they gave you all this worthless Zimbabwe money, and they, the government took all the dollars. That has happened time and time and time again. So we need to exist in a world where people have the ability to keep their own wealth in their own in their own wallet, and they become the the – you know, control of their own destiny. And that requires some financial knowledge. And I think that's something we should be teaching people. Uh, it's like an hour's worth of knowledge could be worth so much in your life. So let me give you this quote. I looked it up and Newton did in fact, in 1720 lose millions of dollars <laughs> in what was the hottest stock in England at well, the time, <laughs> the South Sea Company. 
And he was quoted as saying that he could calculate the motions of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. And is they, that's they not had, a because perfect... The, they had a lot of those. That's a great quote, but it, it, it's funny because that timeline. So Newton, after that late 1600s, right when they did the central mm-hmm. bank, because they they created that market uh, that they ended up having. But but they were trying to replicate. There were multiple companies trying to replicate the East India Company that that was so successful, and it was the only one. But there's so many others that went but bust basically. Yeah, bubbles aren't new, and I think there's this attitude that's like, oh, crypto's so new, and all this stuff is so new. I think I was telling you this, Daniel, like we've speed run through a variety of trad find mistakes in a very short window, and hopefully we become anti-fragile soon. Yeah. But I am very concerned that we don't because of all these bad actors. So we've talked a lot about your your history here has been phenomenal, Daniel. It's been very helpful to understand this. Tell us, like the battle we understand the battle but what are some things to be optimistic on right so if you painted a vision for us of you know these are this is very serious the stakes are very very high what are you optimistic about in crypto right now what are the use cases that you think are going to drive us into the next phase because i'm hoping that there's a positive phase after the one that we're in right now but what is it that's getting you really excited what are you hopeful about well I think that as time goes on, there's more understanding by every it's every day. There's more traction, more knowledge. There's a new person that learns about how to get a, have a have a wallet, and maintain a wallet. I think it's really important. Um, there's a lot of great. I, I, it's funny. I'm I'm probably gonna piss off a lot of people. You know, you you, you meet people um, who are Bitcoin maximalists, right? And um, and then you have like Ethereum. Like I'm very big into Ethereum, um, and it's a real thing. There's this little war, and I think we're all in it together as far as I'm concerned. But I believe in smart contracts, and the problem is Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracts. And so that opens up a lot of problems because if you want to do a private trade with somebody on Bitcoin, the old days were like a drug deal. You'd have to go meet somebody at McDonald's. Have you seen some of the interesting work that's being done to do smart contract functionality on side chains of Bitcoin? That are federated mm-hmm. by different multisigs. No, I wasn't because I'm not so familiar with the Bitcoin ecosystem. I'll send you, I would love to know. Yeah, that. we we interviewed one of the guys <clears throat> who's done a lot of research on Sovereign, which is uh, Bitcoin backed dollars, and it's on a side chain of Bitcoin, so you're still rolls up to the main chain. So okay. there's definitely some innovation there, but you're exactly right. The base layer has no smart contract functionality, so it's extremely limited. And Lightning, like as an example, Lightning hasn't really gone anywhere and has had some challenges. And there have been some weird gas situations because of these meme coins that they're doing now. And I'm like, if you're going to do anything and they're trying to replicate like some of the stuff with Ethereum, if you're going to do anything, add smart contract functionality because Bitcoin is was the it's the o, it's the OG, it was the first. Now Bitcoin, from its very first day it launched, has had many modifications since it is upgraded. It should have smart contracts. And I'm a big believer in smart contracts. And so because of that, like people use the term Web3, you cannot do a Web3 experience without connecting your wallet. And you cannot connect your wallet unless you are using smart contracts, period. And that game is Ethereum. And everybody else is built around that. So I'm a huge fan of the Ethereum ecosystem um, and and anyone that's smart contracts. But use cases to me, there's there's tons – that you could point to, but I think that we need to get out of the casino mindset that always exists. It'll always exist. But it, if the focus is about like giving people access to, like if you think about things like Ethereum has done, where if you lose your um, if you lose your passphrases, you can have now a friend where like you know through a third party that you can actually val- validate your your identity. Like, Ethereum is really progressive. They're trying to find solve some of these problems. Um, I actually have a great use case, I think, of for NFTs connected to storage units that I think are amazing. Um, but it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to you got a wallet. You're the custodian of your own, of your, you know, of your own funds or whatever that may be. And you're connecting that to via smart contract to other things, whether it be a website, whether it be a trade of some kind. It could just simply be. Um, I, think, I think NFTs will eventually just be digital, um, just really digital uh, licensing. So if you're a big fan of Taylor Swift, you know we've already seen this play out many times over. Red has done it. Uh, different concerts have done it. You know that's real money where, you know, in terms of real business, real industry, where people are a Taylor Swift fan and they get some special cool NFT that is a, rem- a memory of or as the ticket. You know that's kind of cool. So 
those things matter to me. And you can, by doing that, you're going to be able to cut out unnecessary middlemen. And what impact does that then have on a ticket master in the future when a Taylor Swift can connect directly to her fans versus a ticket master? Those are the things that have yet to be proven. I agree with you. I'm, I'm trying to think through some of the use cases I'm most excited about. And I agree about smart contracts in general. I mean, what do you think, John? No, the smart, con you're right. Smart contracts are necessary 100%. And I, I'm totally in line with your thinking about that and, and, and the shortcomings of Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, uh, the biggest thing, uh, you know, Bitcoin's its own worst enemy sometimes. And, sometimes. Uh, uh, but it's still the OG, it's still, you know, has that, you know, limited supply. That's right. Which people are very attracted to for, uh, a good reason. Uh, I think because of that, it makes it a pretty poor money. Um, but other people would argue with me. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about if we can just focus on the things that need to be focused on. And, and like you said, the casino and the, you know, I think to a large part, the market is kind of taking care of those people. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some people that made a lot of money and are broke right now. And, uh, you know, maybe they'll go to another industry uh, to find that uh, dopamine fix, you know, of looking at your wallet every two or three hours and go, oh, I'm up another 500 bucks, you know, or whatever. You know, I, it's really hard to get people like that off the drugs. But, you know, uh, it's good. And there'll always be people that will provide them, too. You know, there'll always be protocols that are going to cater to people like that. Um, well, so. I know we're close to the next bull run because Beanie's back, and you know Beanie is a huge scam artist, and uh, he is uh, he was gone, and now he's back, and he's professing all this. Uh, he's got all the prophecies, and he's gonna you know he's gonna hoodwink and trick all kinds of people. I would say that is my opinion. Let me be very clear, careful. That is my opinion of Beanie as his character. You do your own research, but um, he'll you know there are people. Who are going to have done bad things? They're going to come back in the through the you know out of the woodwork, and they're going to be a whole new group of suckers. They're going to be there to to rape and pillage. You know I, I, that kind of brings up a really interesting point that that I've always thought about is that you know if you look at people over you know uh, and just the short time I've been in crypto, you know these 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 personalities that rise to the top and get media focus social media focus and yeah. you know whether it's an sbf whether it's uh you know uh you know danny from wonderland you know and people start drawing it becomes a cult of personality yeah. and then everybody that i've ever put in that position in my life has always let me down and so but on the other hand you know then there's that whole other I want to be completely anonymous. I don't want to interact with anybody. I just want to build the protocols and keep my head down and do that. There's got to be a way that those two things can kind of come together. Because I think if there's a legitimate champion for the space that Pete, the public recognizes, that would be a good thing. But, you know, when they stumble, the whole industry falls apart, as we've seen, right? You know, those well, that people, was Satoshi. And, yeah. and and Satoshi to me was Hal Finney. I believe in my heart Hal Finney was Satoshi, and that's why we don't hear about interesting. Why we don't hear Hal Finney? If you ever seen the documentary on Hal Finney, he got yeah. um, Lou Gehrig's disease. And yeah. and Satoshi's very last uh, message was very 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 short. And uh, Hal Finney was uh, in his last days was literally communicating via eyelid movements. That was the only way he could communicate. Wow. He was doing Morse code with his eyelids to write things. You know, I couldn't even imagine that guy was so smart. Um, and then he, he died and coincidentally never heard from uh, him ever again. You never heard from Satoshi again. It's to me, it's so clear. And he, we all already know how funny was the guy, the first guy to do the, the first block, you know, transaction. The reason why though, it was illegal to create Bitcoin. And so just like how governments are now going after people, they're going after now DeFi, sometimes and they're so you're well, going to see anonymous developers the tornado cash one i, I put the link yeah. here the treasury has designated them and sanctioned one of the developers of tornado cash who just created code and that is why and first of all that should be a protected class because you're uh the technology uh, you're just a coder 
But um, that is why you'll have a lot of anonymous developers, period. And it, in my opinion on that is like, fuck them. Like if, if the developers should have complete ability, if you're going to, if you're going to try to clamp down on people like that, who are just human beings, then uh, they're going to, uh, they're going to dig deeper holes and you're not going to be able to find them and, and good luck. And it'll be very hard. And now you can try, you can spend a lot of money and you might get lucky like you did with the, they got the, the guy from Silk Road, they caught him, you know, so they, they did catch him, but it's just saying it's just like people are going to it'll be that kind of game and i think a, a really smart developer will uh, protect themselves now i'm not a developer so i don't have those kind of skill sets but um but if i was a developer then i would be highly highly anonymous so let's talk about that for a second you what would be your advice to somebody who's considering jumping into this industry it doesn't necessarily have to be a developer maybe there's somebody with more skill set outside of that space is is now a good time to jump into crypto either from a career perspective or as an investor perspective and we're not giving investment advice here of course but you know for me when i jumped into the crypto industry it was on a nice upswing and i'm still here i still believe in it uh but i still want to be here and i still want to keep building but is now a good time to consider jumping in well my investment advice is to get into the harry potter barack obama bitcoin <laughs> Did you see that one i've seen this this is so kidding. funny it is so it's got to be the worst like abortion of the funniest <laughs> brands slammed together so funny yeah, i just I, that was a joke uh no you know that expression they say um uh, when's the best time to plant a tree seven years ago when's the second best time today and uh today. and and i believe they're you know it, when's a good time to get into crypto is now it is now um it we are on it, it depends on what your purpose is like you're talking about building a lot of people are a lot of people are still in it you remember the i love that meme there's this indian guy and he's got the big gold chains and he's like i'm in it for the technology have you seen that one i, I have not that sounds awesome you haven't seen this meme <laughs> no. there's this oh wait is it an actual picture or is it it's a, a picture, picture of an indian guy with big gold chains and it's like, you know, his stash. And then it's just nice. like, and he's just like, I'm in it for the technology. Meanwhile, it's just gold out. Right. And, um, <laughs> truth is a lot of people don't care about building, you know, you know, people don't, a lot of people don't. So, but the people who do are going to change the world the same way that the internet, you, a lot of there's users of the internet and, and, and apps on the internet. And then there's the creators. Um, there will be builders. It is going to be very, you know, transformational. Back to the question about building and now, I, I really believe that it is, you know, now is a good time. Um, the, but but everyone should learn the lesson because it will repeat itself. I was talking about like these scam artists who kind of pop themselves out and now they're back out of the woodwork. Everyone needs to learn the lesson of BitConnect. You say that, you know, like 2017 feels like, uh, you know, I've talked to people who consider themselves to be fairly knowledgeable about crypto who have no idea what BitConnect is. It scares me. It was, it, it's such a important story because I remember it blew up like crazy and so many people got burned. And in hindsight, it's like, that would never happen to us. And here we are, FTX. Well, all over again. Well, I would say Terra, Lu Terra Luna is probably the closest thing to BitConnect because it was, uh, you know, it was a perpetual motion machine and never lost money. Yeah, yeah, guaranteed to give you your return. And BitConnect was guaranteed to give you a return. Can never go wrong. Anything that guarantees your return should scare the shit out of you. It really should. Um, so it's like you got to learn the lessons of history. Um, there was one more uh, I was going to – oh, oh, as an example, Tyler, you know, do, do you know what cred is? You ever heard of cred? No. Cred was the first Celsius. Hmm. And it went bust. And it went bust because it was searching for high, higher ROIs. And – Quadri Quadriga X, you remember Quadriga? Yes. Okay. So Canadian crypto exchange founder dies, hundreds of millions of dollars, all of a sudden missing. He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's like when you yeah. know I lost my guns in a boating accident. You know, it's a very sad situation. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I don't have them. I lost them. Good to know. So this is the stuff that we need to that we people have to learn the lessons of and and you really have to learn like this these things you have to understand that 
when you have an issue and you go into a Discord chat and then somebody messages you from support and they're like, they give you a link to click on to connect your wallet to solve the problem, do not do it. Do not connect your wallet to, un, to, to links you're not familiar with and you're not 100% uh, safe about. Be very careful what you connect your wallet to because they have the ability to p withdraw all the funds. You know, so like these are really important le learning lessons that uh, people need to learn from and preferably learn it from somebody else's uh, downfall, not your own, because you can get wrecked so quickly and it can be very devastating, very devastating. And don't engage in like try to avoid uh, gambling addictions, which exist. You know, you have somebody like uh, Franklin, the, the NFT trader that, you know, and you have Machi that's doing all this trading. Uh, that's trading down board Ape. So people just need to understand. And if you really understand what the hell you're even in it for, if you if it's all about making money, if it's all about making money, then my advice my advice would just be buy some Ethereum and sit on it. That's do your own research. That's what I yeah. would. That's what I would do. I think people need to find their why. And yeah. I'll pass it to John in a second for some closing thoughts because I know we need to run here. But one of my biggest pieces of advice is to anybody is figure out why you're even interested in this in the first place. Yeah. Find your version of crypto. So maybe you're super into payments. So then study the payments use case. Maybe you're super into art, then find NFTs. That's maybe right. you're super into music, figure out royalties and NFT payments. Like there's so many applications of crypto to your niche. You don't necessarily have to come into crypto and be a trader. That's why, like you said, CNBC yeah. is not helping because it's just Bitcoin go up and people just treat it like every other asset class. So that has been my advice. John, I think you would agree with that too, right? I mean, that's always been our advice to our listeners. Find your why. Yeah, 100% because, you know, like anything, if you're just here to make money, which there's nothing wrong with that, it's perfectly okay, but you're just using the system to get what you want, which it's there for that. But, you know, if you're going to, if you want to, if this is a new, say, career, and I think that's maybe more what we're talking about, maybe if it's, it's a career or a shift in your life. Yeah, you got to dig into what makes sense to you. Once you learn the basics of, of, of the system, it's like, yeah, as Tyler said, payments, stable coins, NFTs, royalty payments, uh, you know, what, whatever it might be. You might, you might be focused on privacy because you're really passionate about keeping everything you have completely private and anonymous. There's so many technologies built into this space that people can dig into. Uh, you don't need to be a generalist, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I love Twitter. I love social media, but it gives a false sense of 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 what the market is sometimes because yeah. people are offering advice or I called that the last time and this is the next big thing or, you know, hey, this is the next hot sector or whatever. You know, you get that in the traditional market, too. Right. And I mean, it's it, and I think that's a. It's almost a precursor to getting into crypto because I think the big weakness most people get into crypto is is they have a very limited financial knowledge to begin with. Yeah, and they just they just see the numbers and they want that. And uh, learn some basic finance, just some basic traditional finance and how markets operate. I mean, exactly what you're saying. This is how a market operates. You know, you need to understand that. How, some people use leverage. That doesn't mean they're a better person or they're you know. Uh, they know more than you. Uh, it's you know what leverage is for crying out loud, and how you can lose your your shirt and your, your shirt, house, everything time. you yeah. own. Yeah. So I think that under underpinning of traditional financial knowledge is 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 really important because then you'll really know where these protocols can add value if if it's a financial use case, if it's NFTs or social social uh social token or whatever it might be you know you know there's so many different areas but there will be things that you will be in, or in engaging with with a smart contract or a blockchain and you won't even know it and i think the, the scary thing in a good way um is once you take artificial intelligence you know it's really just machine learning it's not really ai right but but you know, i honestly am so impressed with what's happened already i mean i was so tired of 2017 raising money, you know, for your company, everyone was talking about like, let's say you're into crypto or you say blockchain. It's like, okay. Cause it was a buzzword. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. And then other people were like, Oh, I'm into AI. And then maybe they were, maybe they weren't. And I always thought AI, anybody who talked about AI was full of it. Cause if you weren't Amazon or one of these major players, I thought you were just full of it, full of it, full of it. 
And here you are, and you know, it's really been a massive sea change. It was like, you know, suddenly, you know, the gradually, gradually, then suddenly. And I mean, Mid Journey is unbelievable. Mid Journey is incredible. I mean, that blew me away. I'm using it like every other day right now, and ChatGPT as well is unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable. It's insane. And you take that and you think of those as tools I and mean, human beings and how we've progressed and we, you know, we've gotten <clears throat> what makes us different than, than an, other animals. We are animals, but is that we can use tools, right? And they can use tools sometimes, but like we're really good at using tools and creating tools. AI and blockchain are going to be tools for us. And you take, you know, uh, AI with blockchain and it's going to be very powerful. And I think people who can create those tools, who can build those things and make a, easy user interface that people can use um it can be very transformational very can i just make a, a huge point about this too because circling all the way back to how we started this conversation talking about the regulators is that they're trying to uh make a moral judgment on a tool and yeah. a tool as we all know does not kill somebody hurt anybody or cause terrorism it is the person who is using the tool and that is a designation that has helped society advance to right. some of the greatest accomplishments we've ever achieved uh, such as the internet, international freeways, uh, cars, horses and buggies were afraid of cars coming and taking their business, right? And it was all so dangerous. Every single innovation has been poo-pooed by the incumbents. And so now is the time to consider what this tool can actually accomplish. Crypto, the time is now. I hear you. I completely agree, Daniel. Uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. Um, tell us, where can people find you? LinkedIn, now that I'm basically unemployed uh so uh linkedin is, <laughs> is maybe where... people should send you job <laughs> offers right based on this interview we did i don't know what i'm gonna do I, i'm trying to figure that out i'm trying to find my well, next thing one thing that's for sure is i know the industry needs your voice and that's something that i've always appreciated about you daniel from when i first met you is you are not afraid to share your views and no. uh you're very well researched and you know what you're talking about so thank you so much for sharing your insights with our community uh john any last words before we go no, but uh, since we haven't done one of these podcasts with a guest in a while, this was uh, this is a great first one to get back on the horse. I, I agree. Fun. It I was a good time. Yeah, Daniel, we'll have to do it again. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And I hope everybody listening has a great rest of your day. Feel free to give us a like and a subscribe if this was enjoyable. And we'll catch you on the next one.